I know so many new people are joining in. I have been coming here to preach every year, many times a year, since 1988. So it's 35 years in a row, except for the two COVID years. And uh, I love and respect and admire uh, your pastor so much. Pastor Tim is a, a, like a brother uh, to me. I love uh, Pastor Tim and Cindy, Pastor Carter and Dr. Teresa. We've been friends and serving the Lord together for so many years. I'm, I'm giving myself about 10 seconds to learn my English back because my whole life is in French. And since we haven't traveled in the last two years, I haven't practiced my French. And you know, the French people that are there, I'm sure they're very disappointed. They, they know me from the French world and they come to Times Square Church to hear somebody from Times Square Church and they're stuck. They're stuck with the French pastor again. I'm sure they said, not him. Again, we try to flee. You run away from him. And here he is uh, back in Times Square Church. Um, I love your, your, the spirit of your pastors. I love their, their faith. I love their, their passion for Christ. I love this staff. When I look over the elders, we've been uh, coming to serve with them here for uh, three decades. I've been with some of these elders around the world. And, and to see, uh, I remember hearing uh, getting the, them getting up every morning so early to pray and seek God. So uh, uh, as Pastor Patrick said, don't take for granted the, the godly leadership that God has placed. The Bible warns us against flattering lips, but admonishes us to give honor to whom honor is due. So I want to honor Pastor Tim, uh, our general overseer, Pastor Carter, and also these, these elders, Pastor Patrick and the team. Can we all honor them tonight? I want to speak to you tonight. I want to speak on God's dream for you. And my real title is God's dream is greater. Would you lean over to the person next to you with a big smile and say to them, God's dream is greater. Say that, please, to someone next to you. Just a few days after, we, after Easter, after we've celebrated uh, God's, ultimate, uh, God's ultimate dream of redemption and of restoration and of resurrection for every man or woman who will come uh, to Christ, I want to remind you that God's dream for you is greater. And I want to read to you Psalm 126, 1 to 6. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouths were filled with laughter and tongue and with singing. Then they said, said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And we are glad. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the stream of the south, those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually, would you say out loud, continually? He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Now this, this is, uh, I see a prophetic picture in this psalm. Of course, it is a, perfect, uh, a prophetic picture for all ages and all people through all generations. But the Bible says that the sons of Issachar understood, uh, that they understood what they needed to do because they understood the time. They knew what to do because, because they understood the times in which they were living. And I felt that as I was praying for Times Square Church and praying for Pastor Tim and praying for the elders and praying for your, your dream and your mission as a church, I, I felt a prophetic picture for specific, specifically for us in Psalm 126. Uh, for such a time as this, 51st and Broadway, uh, uh, in the spring of 2022, we look in this psalm and we see uh, what we've been going through and what is coming. A season, a, I see a season of worship through war. When the Lord brought us, ba us back from captivity, uh, from captivity, we were like those who dream. And we, we have this feeling after the two years of the pandemic of coming out, we came out of a worldwide uh, pandemic uh, to step in to uh, headlines of genocide and a war that has, that has, uh, uh, that has consequences that I believe only the Lord, that, that has uh, possibilities and consequences that I believe only the, the Lord knows. And, and, and when we go, we, we went through the, it's like a war, but, uh, but I don't know if you felt the same thing, but we, I felt that our, our worship, there's, there's some that ran, but I, I felt that our worship deepened during that season of war. 
I felt the worship from Times Square Church. I watched it every week, and I felt the worship. How many of you felt that in this, as everything is shaken, it, there's, a, there's a worship through war. We are learning to worship through war. Our mouth was filled with worship, and the joy of the Lord has been and will be our strength for everything we go through. It's also a season of worldwide witness. They said among, they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And I felt, uh, I felt that just to remind you, uh, the, the congregation, the, the members, the heart, uh, the people of Times Square Church, of the worldwide impact of Times Square Church. A few weeks ago, I watched Pastor Tim's message, the world changed in one night. And in a few weeks, half a million people had downloaded the message. Now, Times Square Church is not only a church at the crossroads of the world, as we have been saying for so many years, but I believe with a message from God to impact the world. I pray and I, I admonish you to pray for your pastor, to pray for those that communicate, to, because as they speak to you and feed you a fresh word, they're also speaking. The, the world says great, uh, the great things that God has done for us. It's a season of worldwide witness for Times Square Church. It's also a season for all of us of weeping as we walk. That expression has been in my spirit for since the beginning of the years. So in tears and will weep with joy. He or who continually, those who continually never stopped going forward weeping. There's that sense of, of, of the God's dream will only be greater. God's dream is only greater when we continue to sow in tears, to allow him to change us and mold us and, and to re-communicate his heart to us so that uh, we, would, we would lay hold again of his dream, not only to, to uh, prepare us for, for the next step, season of his dream, but to, to, to gather us together, to complete it together, that, that, uh, what he's called us to be and to do together. Never stop. Never stop walking forward, even as you weep. We all have seasons of weeping, but those who continue, just continually stop forward. This church was built on weeping as we serve and walk with God, weeping for his heart, weeping for, his, uh, for, for, his, uh, his, for souls. We weep and pray for souls. We re weep and pray tonight for our loved ones. We weep and pray for backsliders. We weep and pray for our city. We weep and pray for this nation. We re weep and pray for the nations. We weep as we walk through a deepening sense of ungodliness all around us, but with his dream burning within us. We weep and pray for his heart, his fresh vision. We weep and pray for his dream because God's dream for you is greater. When you see the word dream or vision, it's all over the scriptures. And in the Hebrew Old Testament, he will be the word chazon. And that word is translated uh, as dream or vision or revelation or the prophetic destiny that God has for each and every one of us in every sphere, every sphere of our life and for us as a people. When there is no, uh, Proverbs 29, 18 says, when there is no vision, no revelation, no fresh dream, the people will perish. The people will cast off restraint. And when there's no vision in a man's heart or in a believer's heart or in a marriage or in a family or in a church, when there's no fresh dream and vision, the people cast off restraint. The people slowly, slowly dry up. And that heart for God's dream is never a matter of age. It's a matter of attitude. It's a heart of anticipation. It's not a question of how much theory or theology I have or you have. It's a, even a, what a great testimony I, I've had yesterday. It is always a matter of thirst, of spiritual thir thirst. Ha happy, blessed are those that thirst, thirst for God's dream, for God's fresh revelation. Well, no matter what season I'm in in my life, it's not a matter of what season I am in my life. There's never a season when I'm not thirsting anymore. It's, a, it's not a matter of what season I am in my life but of seeking, uh, of seeking him, of seeking him. It's not a matter of what great past history we had, but it's a matter of our hearts, our hearts today. And, and tonight I want to take a few minutes to look with you 
and, and remind you that God's dream is for you is greater. And we'll look in the life of, of Joseph. Now, I've been teaching for 10 weeks at our church on Joseph. I'm just giving you a, a few thoughts tonight. But Joseph is called the dreamer, and he teaches us so much about, about God's dream and about the fulfillment of God's dream and answers so many questions. Answers, for example, that question we've all had. Uh, what, I, what, what happens when, when I've had this dream? I know it's from God, but years have passed. Years have gone by, and I'm, I'm, still, I'm still waiting for the dream. Joseph uh, is 17 years old when he receives a dream from God, and 20 years will pass before he will see its fulfillment. And it'll be a succession of trials that will test him, but trials that will transform him and, and equip him for his testimony. Joseph teaches you and me that delays in your life, in your relationship with God, and in your dream God has given us, uh, delays in your life do not mean denials. That, that he or she who will possess the dream must first be prepared for the dream. Nobody said amen, but this was really good. You should have said amen there. Everybody wants the power and the position, and everybody wants the prosperity and the position and the, and the power, but nobody wants the process. God's process in our life. God's dream is greater. So we'll read a, a lengthy portion in, in, in Genesis 37. And it's the first book of the Bible. It's going to be on the screen. And for some of you, it might be new, but I, I know many of you know. So please, please, would you do this with me? Let's read this as if we read it for the first time. In Genesis 37, now Jacob dwelt, verse 1, dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And he had, um, and he, and the lad was with the sons of Bilah and the sons of Zippah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. First lesson, nobody likes a snitch. That's the first lesson. <laughs> Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a tunic, a, a garment of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him. And could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream. And he told it to his brothers. And they hated him even more. So he said to them, please, please hear this dream. Which I have dreamed. They were, there we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheep arose. Uh, and also stood upright. And indeed, all of you, you sheep stood, stood around and bowed down to my sheep. Don't you feel like that, that grabbing Joseph's face and say, stop, stop. You're doing this. You need to do this. And his brothers said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his word. Then, then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers and his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream that you have been dreamed that you've dreamed? Shall your mother and your brothers indeed come down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him and his father had kept the matter in mind. But his brothers went uh, to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, are you uh, are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said he, to him, here I am. Then he said to him, please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flock. So he went out in the valley of Hebron and he went out to Shechem. Verse 18. Now, when they saw him from afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against, to, against him to kill him. And they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him to the pit. And we shall say some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. Verse, uh, verse 23. So it came to pass that when Joseph had come to his brothers, that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty. There was no water. Verse 28. And then the Midianite traders passed. So the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Verse 30, uh, verse 32. So they took Joseph's tunic, killed a kind of goats, and dipped the tunic in the blood. 31, 32. Then they sent the tunic of many colors, and they brought to the fathers and said, we found this. Do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? 
and he recognized it, and he said, it is my son stooning. A wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes and sackcloth on his waist and mourned his sons for many days. And all his sons and his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, I shall go down to the grave with my son in mourning. This is my, this, this, uh, thus his father wept for him. Now the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. I would like to, to propose I would like to propose to you that God's dream is for you is greater than your failures and your betrayals. It's greater than our fears of what tomorrow will bring. And God's dream for you is greater because of his favor and his blessing. I'm always astonished after all the years of studying the Bible. I'm always astonished at the brutal honesty and transparency of the biblical and biographical narrative about the men and women of God in scriptures. There's no makeup. There's no, um, the, the, there's no Photoshop. There's no filters. There's no Facebook or Instagram where everything, every meal, every house, every couple, and every kid is so perfect. No, that's not. Scriptures just throw it at you to remind you that God's dream for you is greater than your failures and betrayal. It is greater than the worst possible uh, past history or background. Joseph's family uh, context and history is deeply dysfunctional. It's sordid, really. His father had moments when he, and seasons when he walked with God, but his name means deceiver, conniver. Jacob's main name is deceiver, conniver, uh, uh, liar, deceiver, conni uh, conniver. He, he's a spiritual passive father who creates in his house an atmosphere of rivalry and jealousy, deep-seated resentment, bitterness, and an unimaginable hatred uh, of the brothers uh, that, uh, towards, towards Joseph. And when you read the story in the Bible, right there, black and white, you have a background where there's incest and there's murder and there's violence. And there, Joseph re received God's dream in a dark family environment and context of deep anger, shame, codependency, immorality, secrets. That's the life he got. But the name Joseph means God added to my life or God has answered, or God has made things possible. I have a question for you tonight. How many of us are candidates for God to add his dream to our lives? How many of you are candidates for God to add his dream, his grace, his mercy, his will, his goodness to your life? Say yes, please. I want to, I want to tell you my personal testimony is very simple. If you subtract What God has added to my life, there's nothing good left. How many of you would say, nah, nah, but, from the but for the grace of Christ, what I am, I am because of the grace of God. Would you say yes? If you're thinking today, I have dark, dark zones in my life, in my past, in my family, wounds, failures, betrayal, betrayal, family, bad, you went, uh, divorce or childhood abuse or neglect. Failures of others that have deeply affected you or your own mistakes that have dwarfed God's plan for, for a season in your, in your life. If you, if you, uh, if you are battling with the disappointment in yourself, disappointment of, of people that, that you love, imagine Joseph and what his brothers did or the disappointment in, 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 uh, in the church, disappointment in Christians, disappointment in Christian leaders, disappointment in the church. Hear God's voice today. If you, if you think your background is so sordid, there's things that, uh, that it would always hold me back. Please hear God's voice today saying to you, my dream for you is greater than any betrayal, any failure. My dream is greater. Say it out loud. His dream is greater. Please, it's so important that you lay hold of this principle. Joseph was innocent of what happened to him, but he was immature. He needed instruction as we do. He needed, he was inconsiderate. He needed instruction in his interpretation and even implementation and even incarnation of God's dream for him. God allowed his tunic to his garment of many colors to be taken from him because it represented his, the need in his life for him to learn not to reproduce 
the toxic patterns he had received. He needed to be stripped away so God would put his garment on him. Uh, Jacob loved him more than all his other sons. And he gave him a, a coat of many color. When you study the Hebrew text, the many colors, many commentators think that it was actually a garment with, with uh, precious stones, shiny little precious stones all over. And, and it was a garment from, from uh, neck to ankle. This is an Elvis suit in the desert. This is a man showing up in a, to a construction site with a mink coat. You get this? Don't miss this. Joseph was not responsible for the grief that, brought, that his past brought to him, but he still needed to grow in the process for God's plan to be fulfilled. No doubt his brother's betrayal broke his heart. Broke his heart when they threw him in the pit. It, it broke his heart. And we have a glimpse, we have a glimpse of their, uh, of the cruelty and their callousness because later on they would say in Genesis 42, 21, they said to one another, we are truly guilty concerning our brother for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us in the pit, Joseph pleaded with them and we were not here. Uh, we were not here. The healing, please listen. And, and if you receive this, it will equip, help you to fulfill God's dream. The, the um, healing of our past to fulfill God's dream relies on our learning the balance between these two great spiritual realities. I must recognize my own wounded, woundedness. I must recognize and acknowledge my woundedness and its effect on my calling and bring it to God. But, and however, I must take responsibility in a renewed, repentant heart to change. There's, there's recognition, but then there's responsibility. And my response, so God can mold me. The dream is true, but I must learn to whom and when to talk about it. The mental will be a part of his history. Joseph would become the number two in Egypt, and he would be the man. Uh, his brothers would come, and he would save not only the family, but the nation from a, the, the worst family of, the, of history at that point. The mental, uh, the mental will be a part of his history, but the messenger needed to learn humility. The tunic was prophetic, but the testimony would require patience. The developing of our destinies will require certain debts. Jesus says, said, unless the seed dies, it cannot bear fruit. What a traumatic moment it must have been for Joseph when they throw him in the pit. This is his brothers. There's no water in the pit. We don't know how long he was there, but we know he was screaming. We know he was pleading. And when he heard his brother's voices come, yeah, come back from afar and he hears them come back, you could hear his heartbeat and you can hear him think, I knew it. I knew they wouldn't leave me here. Those are my, after all, those are my brothers. I'm, I'm the youngest. They, they're going to pull me out. But his brothers pull him out. And when he sees a, a, a hand of his brother, and, and his brothers pull, only pull him out to sell him into slavery. And when they reach down to him to pull him out from the pit, only to sell him as a slave. Now, let me repeat. The, the deeper developments of your destiny will require certain deaths. You need to die. You need to die to something. Joseph, the death of reliance on men is one of the, Joseph would, would go through more than once in the developing of God's destiny in his life. Like Joseph, we have to learn to refuse to depend on the fickle approval, praise, and resources of men. We work with people, we, we, we honor people, we learn from people, we listen to people, but you know, our trust and confidence for the fulfillment of this dream is in God and God alone. Say yes, please. In the three stages of God's dream for him, over 20 years, Joseph had three sets of two dreams. Uh, with his brothers, then in prison when he interpreted the dream of two of the prisoners. That's what led him to the palace later on. And then with the Pharaoh, in all three seasons, over 20 years, he had to learn to die to the momentary praise, approval, and security that comes from men. When his brothers sold him for 20 pieces, 20 shekels of silver, it is very sordid, but historians say there was a, gra a gradation of value with uh, the slaves. And when they say 20 shekels, uh, many commentators say that it was the price, it was the value, the estimated value of a damaged slave. 
of a handicapped slave, of a weakened slave. That's how his brother saw him. That's how Potiphar saw him. And maybe that's how Joseph saw himself in that moment. But God's dream is greater. God's dream is greater. So when, uh, when in horror, when in horror, his brothers put him uh, uh, and they took him away and the, the, the slave masters took him away and the voices fade of his brother and maybe he's still screaming. And when the voices of his brothers fade and, and a dark silence comes upon Joseph, he hears in his spirit, God speaking and God wasn't only speaking to Joseph. He's speaking to someone here, someone online tonight that needs to hear it. God saying to him, God declaring his unending love and faithfulness. Uh, uh, let me use the words of Isaiah 49, 15, 16. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion of the son of her own womb? Surely they may forget. But God says, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands and you are before my eyes forever. Say yes, please. God, God's dream is greater than our fears of what tomorrow will bring. Can you imagine the loneliness, the fearfulness, the absolute? He was cut out from all human security, all human, yeah, all human support. He's, he's an absolute darkness about his future. But God was teaching him, my dream for you is greater than your, your worst fears about tomorrow. That's why Joseph, Joseph would grow to a point in his life where he would actually declare to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God turned it around for the good. In this beautiful Isaiah passage I just read, God contrasts, makes a contrast, stark contrast between the worst of human betrayal. Some of you might have experienced a mother abandoning her child and his an unconditional and everlasting love, care, attention, and commitment to his dream in us and through us. God is literally saying, you're always before my eyes. I have inscribed your names on my hands. In modern terms, he would say, uh, uh, I would say this, with God said, I've tattooed your name on my hands. You know, don't write me emails about tattoos. Um, <laughs> we live in an age where people get tattoos for many reasons, causes, and many young people will tattoo someone's name that they're vowing eternal love for. I read somewhere, I read somewhere in a magazine that years ago, the actor Johnny Depp uh, was so in love with Wyona Ryder, the actress, that he tattooed on his arm, Wyona forever. All, all the ladies go, ah. Oh. But then, but then Vanessa came. And she didn't like that tattoo. So he changed it. He, it was very painful. He changed it, took a couple of letters off, and actually had on his arm, why no forever, which isn't great. But God says, but God says to you, nothing can erase your name from my hand. Nothing, I'll never ghost you. Nothing can separate you from my dream, from my love. You should shout better than this. Nothing shall separate you. Nothing can erase, not your sin, not someone else, not betrayal, not failure. Your name is on my hands. My hand is on your life and you are before my eyes forever. My dream is greater. Say yes, please. Greater greater than, than our fears of what tomorrow will bring. The Psalms of Joseph, they're Psalms about Joseph, and they, they give us a glimpse of what was going on in his heart when all this was happening, when he didn't know what tomorrow would bring, when, the, when tomorrow was so dark. In Psalm 81, 5, sing aloud to God our strength, for he established a testimony in Joseph. Do you understand? That's what God wants to do in every one of uh, each of us. Establish a testimony to his glory, not only in us uh, individually in our lives and in our family and sons and grandsons and granddaughters, but also with us as a church. God over the years has established a testimony 51st and Broadway and it's history and the testimony is wonderful. It is awesome. But how many of you know that his grace, his mercies are new every morning and God always saves the best wine for last. God has wants to establish until he comes his final testimony through Times Square Church. Say yes if you want to be a part of it. Sing aloud to our strength. He established a testimony in Joseph. But while it's happening, Joseph's in the pit. Joseph is in Potiphar's house. Joseph is still in prison. And here's the Psalm 105, 17 to 19. This is what was going on in Joseph's heart. 
God sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with feathers. He was laid in irons. And until the time that his word, that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord, the dream of the Lord, God's dream tested him. Have you ever been tested in your heart about God's promise and dream? When the enemy shouts in your ears and when, when all circumstances are saying, there's no tomorrow left for you during the 10 years in Potiphar's house and two years in a prison of injustice. When again, he's unjustly uh, uh, accused when he's in his completely innocent and thrown again in a prison cell of fear and crushing loss of any hope for his future. The word of the Lord was testing him. The word of the Lord was testing him. Please hear me in this, in these last days. We will need, like never before in our lives, to deepen our faith, our surrender, and our confidence that he holds the tomorrows. March 2020, all of us pretty much thought we knew what the next years would bring. But then as Pastor Tim preached prophetically, that in one night, everything changed. So we get to the beginning of 2022, two years later, and we all think pretty much we have an idea of what post-COVID will be, tomorrow will be, and then not only wars or rumors of wars, and, and, and you have headlines of genocide, and never in the recent history has those types of wars and genocide been in an era where, where nuclear powers are in the hands of the countries involved. We don't know. The, I, I would say it in the, in, the sim, uh, in, the, in the simplest way. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Because of it, the elders, that's Hebrew 11, and Joseph is in there. The elders obtained a good testimony. We need to grow and deepen ourselves and root, it on, root ourselves in a stronger faith and confidence. I don't know. I will not know what tomorrow holds, but his dream, his purposes, his faithfulness is alpha, is omega, is the first page, is the last page, and all, all of history is in his hands. Would you say yes, please? God's dream for us is greater than our fears of what tomorrow will bring. In Psalm 102, the, the, the next verse actually gives, uh, uh, tells of what, what happened to Joseph. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people let him go free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all the possessions to bind his princes and his, uh, uh, and his, at his pleasure and teach the elders wisdom. That's what God had for him. Think about it. When Joseph had the dream at age 17 and he saw his brothers in his dream bow to him and then his father uh, bow to him, what do you think it meant to him? What do you, how far do you think it, as a 17 year old, what do you think he thought? Maybe he thought, I'm going to inherit the farm. Uh, I'll inherit, inherit the flock. Maybe my brothers won't be on my back anymore. But God, God said to Joseph, no, your name will be God. It means God has added to my life. But then he named his first son Manasseh, Manasseh. God has made me to forget my sorrow, but that's not all I want for you, Joseph. Ephraim is the second son. God has made me fruitful in the place of my affliction, but that's not all. It is Pharaoh who would give him the name when he comes up in a fulfillment of the dream and becomes a governor that leads the greatest food bank in the history. His name, a name that's put on him, Safana Paneach, the preserver of life. He had no idea. I want you to know that when you don't know what your tomorrow is, and in the worst of of the pit. God's dream will always be. Eye has not seen. My, your mind cannot conceive. Your heart cannot imagine the things that God has prepared for you. They will be revealed by His Spirit. Trust in what God has prepared for you. And please hear something so important. Don't, please do not waste your season of suffering. Don't waste your season of suffering. God has a purpose For your pain. In Galatians, I, I, I know, anywhere I say this phrase, God has a purpose for your pain, I get no amens anywhere, no languages. I've been in 55 countries, I never got an amen to that one. Galatians 3, 3 and 4, are you so, Paul says to the Galatians, are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain? Please hear me. Your tomorrow in God's dream will not be accomplished by flesh, or it will be accomplished by faith. They will not be accomplished by natural means, plans, promotions, and resources. It will be supernatural. 
It will be by the grace of God. Please do not waste your season of pain. Please do not waste your season of pain. Don't waste your pain. Paul said to the, to the Galatians, have you suffered in vain? You need, when you're going through a season like Joseph, when you don't know what tomorrow will be, and, and, and many of us are going through it now, please understand, you need to pray and you say, God, I'm praying that I would find your purpose in this pain, pre preparing me for the next page of your plan. There's a purpose in your pain. Don't waste your pain. As a pastor, it's one of the hardest things to see people go through cycles. I've been pastoring the same church. Uh, the same, the same church uh, for 29 years. And you say, there's some that, that just keep never learn from there. Just keep uh, repeating patterns. No, no. The, through the, uh, find purpose in your pain. Uh, ask Holy Spirit, show me through, through each battle, you can become bitter or you can be better. You can let the liar break you or you can let the Lord teach you, mold you, lift you up. Every delay and detour can derail you or it can deepen you in God. How many of you can remember and testify that through a season of pain, like the psalmist, I went through the waters and I went through the fire, but he brought me out for abundance. He brought me out. The, don't waste your pain. Don't waste your pain. He, a, a, a certain, God can, you, your sufferings can free you from a certain stubbornness. A certain stubbornness with your dream and develop in you a servant heart and deeper surrender. Here it is. Hear me tonight. The 40 years, almost 40 years of ministry. Don't, um, contrary to popular advice and pop culture, don't follow your dream. Follow your God and your dream will follow you. Don't follow your version of the dream. Follow God. Follow his word. Follow his purposes. Follow, wherever you are, serve him. Actually, actually, I never see anywhere in scripture where it says, and Joseph hung on, hung on to his dream and he went through it. And no, wherever he was, he surrendered. Whatever he was, he served. Whatever he was, he believed. Whatever he was, he stood by the grace of God. And God, God was working. I say it again. Don't follow your dream. Actually, Sometimes, in many occasions, our version of what our dream should be is the biggest obstacle to God's dream in our lives. Don't follow your dream. Follow your God, and he will write his dreams on your heart, and your dream will follow you. Say yes, please. You can emerge from your pain with fear and blame, or you can come out with greater faith than ever. And it's my last thought. Greater faith than ever in his, in his favor and his blessing. His favor and his blessing. God's dream for you is greater than failures and betrayals, fears of what tomorrow will bring, and God's dream for you because it's greater because of his favor and his blessing on your life. Chapter 39, in verse 1, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had talked him, uh, uh, taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was successful. This is in a, in a slave house. He was success, a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, that the Lord made all that he did prosper, blessed. So just, Joseph found favor in his sight. And even when that, when that man throws him unjustly in prison for, under the false accusation of his wicked wife in verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy again, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the present. God's dream is greater because of nothing that's from us, but because of his favor and his blessing. Pastor O.S. Hawkins was right when he, 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 was a, he was right when he spoke this internal, eternal truth from this pulpit. A few months ago, he told us the biblical definition of the true fear of God in Christ is not the fear that God's hand will strike me. It's the fear that God's hand will withdraw from me. The judgment for my sins, this is what we celebrated at Easter, the judgment for my sin is on Christ. Christ took all the judgment, all the, all the penalty of our sins was on him. When God looked at the cross, he, he saw your sin and mine, past, present, and future. And when God looks at me now, I, I am in Christ. He sees the perfected work of Christ in my life and yours. You should say amen to that. That's Easter. But O.S. Hawkins was right. It is not the fear, the true fear of God is not the fear that the anger of God, in the, ang of, uh, the anger of God's hand. 
It's the fear of the absence of God's love. I am nothing, you are nothing, unless, just before I went up to preach, my brother, who loved so much, elder, came and said, God is with you. I said, I hope so. Because all we are is only because if you, no matter what you are going through right now, seek the blessing and favor of God. Because uh, that God's dream is greater only because of, I need to say this to someone. You, you, if you receive a dream from God, not everybody will celebrate it. Not everybody will applaud it. Not everybody will say, what can I do to make it happen in your life? You might, you, you can receive a word. Actually, this is a law of the kingdom. If you have a dream that is from God, it will be attacked. It will be maligned. It will be denigrated. You need, you need to not respond and just trust in the hand of God, the blessing of God, the favor of God. Promotion comes from him. Let me close with this. God's dream for you is greater because of his favor and blessing. I want to close with four statements of faith you're able to make, throw, that you're able to live by with full confidence because his favor of blessing is on your life. Are you ready? Statement number one, they can take my coat, but they can't take away my calling. They stripped Joseph of his coat. But they can strip, they can strip you of your coat, but they can't strip you of your character, of your communion with Christ. They can't strip you of your calling. They can make your tunic, they, they can take your tunic for a season, but not your testimony. They can momentarily take away your mental, but not your ministry. It wasn't the only time or last time they would take his coat. Potiphar's wife took his coat. And every time they, they stripped him of, a, uh, uh, of the coat, God had prepared a greater mental for him. God had prepared his mental for him. So that the, the Pharaoh actually put a mental on him and said, a, a mental on him for him to be the feeder of, of the whole nation, to be the man of God for, for the whole nation. God's blessing and God's favor will allow you to walk saying, they can strip me of my coat, but they can't strip me of my calling. Say yes, please. Are you ready for statement number two? I will not mourn for 20 years what never died. Jacob wept and mourned and, and was bitter for 20 years for his son who wasn't dead because he believed the lie. Don't weep for what you think is dead when you are standing before the resurrection and the life. When we stand, the, uh, let me tell you, Easter, God, the, the angels did not roll away the stone so Christ can come out. The angel rolled away the stone so me and you can enter into the resurrection. Don't call dead. Don't call dead what God can bring back to life. Say yes, please. Third statement, because of his mercy, because of his blessing and his favor. Third statement, what seemed to totally destroy my dream was setting me in motion for his fulfillment. When they put him, when they threw him in the pit because of the favor and the blessing of God, his brothers sold him to in, in Egypt, but that's where he needed to go. That's where his destiny was. That's where he, when they threw, when they sold him in Egypt, he thinks everything is over. But God, God's hand was above, and God's hand was was leading when when he needed to be. When he's thrown, when when he's accused unjustly by the, his bought ten years in Potiphar's house, ten years saving, faith, uh, serving faithfully, and then he's accused unjustly because he refused the advances of of the of Potiphar's wife. And when when Potiphar throws him. In the very jail where Pharaoh's prisoners are, and, and the scripture says it in, in Genesis, uh, and Joseph's master took him uh, at the, at, and threw him in the very specific prison, the very place where the king's prisoner was confined. He needed to be there. Can I say to you, Joseph's master, Potiphar, was master of nothing. God was his master. God was leading. God was, what, what you think is destroying you is setting you in motion for what God has prepared for you. And here's my last statement as the musicians come. Even when I have dropped my dream, I can pick it up by his grace and offer it to God again. Mm. I want to close. I'm going to ask Freddie to come. Even when I've dropped my dream, God's dream, I can pick it up and offer it to God again. In Genesis 21, we have... A very, very difficult moment and a very difficult story. Hagar is Abraham's servant. 
she had received a dream for her child, Ishmael. A dream in the midst of chaos, disobedience, impatience, sin. A dream she was participant and drawn into that drew her into a whirlwind of horror. She was suffering because of her own sin and she was suffering because of someone else's, Abraham's disobedience and impatience and unbelief. We find her in Genesis 21 and the Bible says that Abraham rose early in the morning, verse 14, and took bread and a skin of water and putting it on her shoulder, he gave it and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. Then she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water in the skin was used up. And she placed the boy, the dream, under one of the shrubs. Then she went and sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot. And she said to herself, I can't even look at it. Let me not see the death of the boy. So she sat opposite him and lifted her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, What ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the dream, lift up the lad, and hold him in your hands, and I will make him a great nation. And God opened up, opened her eyes. She saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. Have you ever been sent away, abandoned, betrayed? Have you ever wandered in the desert, far away from your dream? Have you ever been in that place when I read this after all the years of reading scriptures? Have you ever been in that place where she, you dropped the dream? She just left it, and she stood at his distance, and all she could do is weep because she, she thought the dream would die. I know some of you understand that weeping, and I have to confess to you that I've wept those tears. It could be for a son. It could be for a dream God had put so deep in your heart. And through somebody else's fault or your own, you dropped it. And it's just so hard. Some of you, even throughout the message, there's a resistance in your spirit. Don't, don't bring me in to believe again. It hurts so much. It's over. She just, I, I, I keep looking at her as she drops it and she stays away and she's just looking at it, weeping. And God said, No. Give it back to me. Pick it up. Bring it back to me. That's his grace, brothers and sisters. That's his grace. That's his blessing. That's his favor. Bring it up. Give it, give it back to me. For I will make him. I still have a dream. I, I heard, if you understand the language of the Old Testament, God says, I, still, I was still at my eyes on your dream. I was still hearing your dream. Don't leave. Pick it up again. God is saying to someone today and online, pick it up. Bring it back to God again. Bring it back to the God of the resurrection again. And then she found water. Christ. She found Christ. She found the water of living. The, the, he's a, if anyone thirsts, let him come unto me. So when I dropped the dream, when I, when I thought it was, a, I bring it up. And I, I offer it back to God again. And then she, God opened her eyes. Opened her eyes. She began believing and feeding and nourishing to dream again. I say to someone, and I close with this, and I pray you will give him all the praise. Thank God we're here today, two days after we celebrated resurrection. No matter what you drop, no matter what, what you, you thought, you walked, you walked. You watched away. You watched from afar with weeping. God says, bring it back. Give it back to me. I am the resurrection and the life. Bring it back to me. I'm the God. Of, would you say, God is, God's dream is greater. Would you give him all the praise that you can, please? Oh. 
Do you know what song I sang most? Maybe than any other during the two years of the pandemic? Waymaker. Waymaker. Even, even when I don't feel it, you're working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. So tonight I want you, I thank you for being so attentive. And I, before we drift out again and, then, and life takes us out and, and we leave, we go back to the city and to our lives and to our countries, all my friends from France and many other countries that are here tonight and online. Can we stand in the presence of God tonight? I'm going to ask you to do something. Can we all stand? Give yourself just a couple of minutes. Can you stand, please? And can you, can you just hold your hands before God? And you close your eyes. I, you're here tonight and you say, and, and online, you're watching this. You say, Pastor Claude, I dropped a dream. I understand betrayal. I understand being thrown into a pit. I understand being sent away. I understand wandering the desert. I understand. I, I, I never seen it like that, but I understand standing from afar weeping over the dream. It hurts too much. I'm just watching it from afar weeping. But I hear God's voice tonight. And he's saying to me, when your brothers and when everybody you trusted threw you into a pit. Your name is written on my hands and on my heart and my eyes, and you will be before my eyes forever. Pick up the dream and give it to me. I want to ask you all over the sanctuary, if you, you say, God, here it is. I'm giving it to you. It could be a child. It could be an adult now. And you say, oh, God, I so wanted him to walk with you. Whatever it is, it could be an addiction that keeps coming back. I thought I had beaten this. And here, here it is again. Whatever it is tonight, would you lift it up? Would you give it back to God all over this place? All over this place. He is here. He is here. And his dream is greater than any betrayal, any failures of others of your own. His dream is greater than whatever fear you may have about tomorrow. And his dream is greater only because of his favor and of his blessing. Would you lift your hands and would you just offer for just for a moment. Freddie's going to lead us with the, the worship team and we're going to sing, Oh God, you're the way maker. Oh God, you are here. And I give, I turn my dream over to you in Jesus. And even before we sing, can I hear a thousand voices going up to God? Can I hear you? And online, wherever you are, God is there with you. Wherever you are, whatever you are listening, wherever you're listening or watching this, you can just lift up your hands and say like, hey, oh God, I'm giving it back to you. I promise he'll open your eyes. He'll open, oh God, I pray you will open our eyes again to your grace and your blessing and your mercy and your commitment and your un, unchanging love. Nothing, nothing can separate us from your love. God, teach us not to waste our pain. We will grow roots through this. We will trust for our tomorrow, not, not in men, in any kind, in any way, trusting in you and in you alone. In you alone, oh God, for my tomorrow, my family, my career, my service, my ministry, the healing of my heart. Oh God, lift your hands and give him the dream. Yeah, give it back to him and let him open your eyes and fill your heart. You are here.